Welcome to problem number five in the Computer Science 121 2013 Winter 2 practice final exam. Okay, direct proof approaches. For the following theorem, big theorem, give a direct proof approach, no proof by contradiction or contrapositive, no use of logical equivalences, that is as complete as possible. Uh, can it be totally complete? Probably not. We don't know anything about P. We don't know anything about Q. So we're probably going to stop when we get to these predicates. If there are choices that the person using your approach will need to make, be sure to give as much detail as possible about how they can make the, those choices. Uh, that's, that's probably going to be referring to existentials. So for instance, we're going to choose Y1. We have to choose Y1 to be in B. We might know some other things. We also know we're going to be able to choose Y1 on the basis of X1, because I can see that X1 is outside Y1 here. So we're already going to know what X1 is by the time we make that choice of Y1. So that's the kind of thing we'll write for that. And at this point, let's just dive in. Uh, as always, we're going to look for the outermost operator to start with. And that outermost operator is this quantifier right here, this universal quantifier. Because in its scope, there is nothing to stop that from going all the way to the end of the statement. So it has everything inside these parentheses in its scope. So let's deal with the universal quantifier. We'll just use our without loss of generality approach, which is what we usually use on universals. Without loss of generality, let x1 b an element of A. And we've gotten rid of our universal quantifier. So what's the outermost operator next? Well, the next outermost operator is this existential. And again, its scope goes all the way to the end of the statement. So we'll handle that existential. And if you're solving this problem as you follow along, now's a good point to pause and try and figure out what you'll write for the existential. What I'm going to write, since I'll usually use a witness proof, is to choose y1 to be equal to some particular value. Now, I don't know what that particular value is yet. Uh, I would have to know more about my proof to know specifically which value I'm going to choose. But I do know that I have the choice. I'm choosing a witness to prove an existential, so I get to pick whatever's convenient for me. And I'm going to put some notes on what I can pick. I know I have to pick some element of B, uh, because that's the domain of my quantifier. So it's got to be in this set B. I also know it can be based on x1. And that might be very useful. I don't know at this point whether it'll be necessary or not. But I can do that because I've already chosen x1. I don't know what it is, but I've chosen it to be this arbitrary element of a. So, you know, if these were both numbers, maybe I could choose y1 to be 2 times x1 or something like that. Basically, I can choose y1 to be some function of x1, and I'm really choosing that function rather than choosing y1 itself. Okay, so now I've gotten rid of this quantifier. Now take a moment and figure out what the outermost operator is that's left. Okay, that outermost operator that's left is this AND here. And it's got one thing on this side, P of x1, y1, 0. And on the other side, it's got the whole second line. So this is an AND. And we're going to have to prove both pieces of this AND. I'll go ahead and do the circled piece here first, because it looks a lot easier. Somehow, I need to prove P of x1, y1, 0. And I don't know what P is, so it's hard to know how I would prove that. So that's as far as I can go with that predicate. Now I'm going to move on to the second half of the statement. And at this point, I've eliminated everything in that first line. All that's left in my statement to worry about is the second line. Okay. Again, you're going to want to find the outermost operator, and then based on that outermost operator, choose a proof technique. I see the outermost operator as this universal, because again, there's nothing to stop its scope from going all the way to the end of the statement. Be careful, it's not this conditional. 
it could be that conditional if, for example, let me rewrite the statement a little bit. This isn't going to be legal because I think, yeah, x2 is referenced all the way over here. So we actually do need this inside the scope of this quantifier here. But imagine we didn't have that. We might have had parentheses here. And that would stop the scope of this quantifier when it hit that parenthesis. And then this conditional really would be the outermost operator. But that's not the way the statement is written. And so we have not gotten to the conditional yet. We're still working on this universal. So we'll say with our loss of generality, let x2 be some arbitrary element of its domain here, a. Then we're going to choose y2 to be equal to something. And just as above, that happens to be in b, because that's what my quantifier says. And it can be based on Oh, what have we got? x1, y1, x2, y... Oh, well, it can't be based on itself. x1, y1, and x2. Okay. So I've taken care of the universal with this line. I've taken care of the existential with this line. I've got yet another universal without loss of generality. Let z1 be an element of a. And finally, I've gotten to the point where the outermost operator is this conditional. So at that point, I'm going to do what I usually do in a direct proof with conditionals. I'm going to assume the left-hand side. Assume p of x2, y2, z1. And I'm just going to make a note for myself here. I wouldn't necessarily write this in my proof that this is antecedent assumption, which could write it in your proof, just so you know why you're making this move, and your reader knows why you're making that move. And then that's going to get rid of this part of my theorem, and I'm just left with all of this. So I'm going to scroll down to make myself some more room. Oh, sorry, scrolled too far. There we go. And I'll finish up. What is my outermost operator? Well, let me get rid of these lines here, because it'll be easier to see once I don't have those. And my outermost operator is this existential right here. So choose z2 equal to, careful, don't just write that this is in b, because we've written it's in b before. It's not, it's in a this time, because that's what the domain says. So that one was in b. This one needs to be in a. And it can be chosen on the basis of, goodness, everything so far. So really, everything else. Uh, x1, y1, x2, y2. And I think that's it. That's all the, oh no, z1 on the basis of all of those things. OK. Then we've gotten rid of this quantifier. And we're left with just qz2z1 and px2y2z2. So all that's left, the only operator I have left to take care of is this one. I'm going to prove both of those parts. So I'm just going to copy them down. I'm kind of out of space uh, to, to move this down here. So let's memorize this. It'll be like a, a Dora episode. Everyone help Steve out remembering what these are. Say qz2z1, Steve, qz2z1. Are you saying that to your screen? Here we go. Prove Q Z2 Z1. And I know you're telling me what the other thing is right now, but I can't hear you. It's a P, and it's got three parts. And X2, Y2, Z2. X2, Y2, Z2. OK. There we go. I've now taken care of all the pieces of my theorem. This is as much structure for my proof as I can imagine extracting from the theorem as it's written. To get any further, I need to know things like what is P? Uh, what is Q? What are these sets A and B? And once I know that, maybe I can actually prove this. As it is, I can't finish the proof. This is as far as I can go.